tonight to make your Atari portable like a Game Boy. And the finishing touches of Ugham 8.0. Plus, take your little cardboard fort and turn it into a PC. Live from the Tech TV studios in San Francisco, it's the Screensavers. Gentlemen, and welcome to the Screen Savers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Kevin Rose. Thanks for joining us on the Screen Savers. From destroying hard drives with 3,000 degree thermite to <laughs> overclocking CPUs with liquid nitrogen, we do it all on the Screen Savers. No matter what the OSHA regs say. That's right. We've got some cool stuff coming up. Pat, what do we got going on today's show? Portable Atari games, turning an Atari 2600 into a portable plus. Ugum 8.0, the last nice. hardware segment, we pick the monitor for Ugum, our the ultimate gaming machine. Ultimate gaming machine. Plus, Yoshi, he was going to share with us his strangest mod ever. Okay, well, basically, right, the, the man is an artiste. He's pushing the mod boundary. He's a big mm -hmm. fan of some of the 70s monitors, 60s and 70s furniture. It was actually made out of cardboard. Made right? out of cardboard. Around, corrugated cardboard. There was an accident during the construction involving a carton cutter. I'll let your imaginations do the rest. But check it out. We actually we can show you what we can show you right now. But we're going to schedule that in the next week or two. And uh, Yoshi's actually getting, getting stitched stitches. up. Yeah. So think warm and fuzzy thoughts for Yoshi. And if you know where we can get those fisherman's gloves that don't cut, yes. send them a pair. He needs Large some of those. Large or extra large. This, was, this just happened a few minutes ago, too. It's literally crazy. like you, you know, had to cancel it minutes before the show. He's okay, though. He's yeah. okay. No permanent damage that we know. Oh my goodness. Jesse? I, You're back. I am back. I am back. I just saw him running around. I had no idea that he just cut his hand open. Is he back? No, I saw him earlier oh. today. I'm, about, I'm back. It's all about the duct tape. <laughs> all about the duct tape. Yeah, so I, um, I'll be in chat today. And, and um, yeah, come and visit because today is my last day here. Oh. Yeah, so come and visit. I'm actually joining the squad over at Tech Live and I'm um, going to be throwing the smack down with Chris Leary. Very cool. That would be yeah. fun. We've got to yeah. have a party. We've got to have a going away party or something. Oh, sure. For sure. Yeah, Bonfire? Let's... Yes. Beach? Bonfire Beach would be That'd a be great good. idea. All right, join us. Very cool. So we're going to learn more about that later on. Yeah. All right. Right now we're going to catch up with the tech news that caught our eye today. Sarah? Miss Sarah Lane? Jesse, you realize that now I'm the oh only guy. I know! That was like a major, major How could you? hang up for me. I'm like, I can't leave her Don't alone. Leave it's me. all boys. What is she gonna do? But Sarah, you, you hold it down, man. Yeah, that's right. You're one. You're, one of the you're not going far, you just be in studio A. Yeah, and I like to be on the show in. very often doing yeah. the check-ins. Oh, what are we Hitting you up every day. Remember Michaela? Jessica? Yes. 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 Pretty good gig. Yes. Okay, moving on to the gig. news now. The FBI is stepping up their crackdown on illegal pirating of copyright protected material. They're kicking off a campaign that includes a new FBI warning seal to be placed on CDs and DVDs. The anti-piracy seal warns that the unauthorized reproduction or distribution of copyrighted work is illegal and punishable by up to five years in prison and $250,000 in fines. Hopefully it'll be better than anti-smoking. It's seals. Well, it's going to be like that thing you see at the beginning of like every VH or yeah. almost every VHS tape or DVD tape where it's like, in case you were clueless, selling and distributing this internationally, <laughs> well, eventually we'll track you down. But that, well, that you stopped know. all piracy, though. Nobody copies DVDs or tapes, right? Well, yeah, no. No, yeah. So I really don't think it's going to have much effect at but, all. But yeah, but part of what they're trying to do is a lot of people are like, I never knew I couldn't download right. songs openly off of So you Napster. can't say that anymore. Yeah, they're trying to make, basically they're trying to say, look, you can do this. There are consequences. Is be aware of them. Do you take the tags off the mattress, yes or no? You can if you're the final consumer. Really? Yes. I did not know that. It's good to know. Sarah, second story? In the weird department of the day, your spam just might smell a little sweeter the next time it pops up in your inbox. Yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> right. According to BBC News, UK internet provider Telewest Broadband is testing a system to let people send aromatic emails over the internet. The company has developed a kind of high-tech air freshener that plugs right into your PC and sprays a smell linked to the message. I think this is super lame. <laughs> this is the nastiest thing I've ever well, heard it's of. it's funny. The first time, like, the whole smell -o internet came up, it was a total <laughs> hoax, a total scam. The second time it came out was a couple years later, a couple years ago. Companies were actually working on this because, you know, the internet going to replace brick and mortar. That's right. You still got to be able to smell your new clothes. It's weird. It's strange. <laughs> and, like, who wants, like, some kind of chemical spraying at you out of your computer? It's, it's not disgusting. the real smell. 
It's just, I don't know. No Actually, one's going to you know buy that. The, the, a lot of the stuff you smell in a supermarket is not That's the real true. smell. That's true. I've read <laughs> Fast Food Nation. I know what goes on behind the scenes. That's no things. Yes. Scary. Scary. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, You're Sarah. You're welcome. We're so terrified. Actually, the, I, I want to test it because you know it's going to be scary. We should get that in for a product review. You can do the demo. I'm not, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> hey, folks, on your card at home, scratch number six to smell along with us. There's an obscure reference. Yes. <laughs> TJ joins on the phone from Vero Beach, Florida. Hey, TJ. Hey. How's it going, man? Going good. How can we help you today? Uh, I was on hold because I'm supposed to uh, go on. You're I've on, man. A, oh, I'm on. Okay. I'd I've like to introduce you to Kevin iPod. Rose. I'm Patrick Norton. This is Patrick. You're what are we first up with? Caller. I was looking down at the iPod at the moment when you picked up. I've got a, I just got a 10 gig iPod. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was wondering, I have a large collection of MP3s. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about did that uh, affect the right. Do you have your, TJ, do you have your television on? No, I do not. Okay. I'm on a hands-free, though. Give me just one Could, second. Yeah, if you well, pick up that telephone, it would be really huge for us because we just okay, got the I'm most on. amazing feedback at this end. There we go. We got okay. it. Excellent. It's a 10-gigabyte um, iPod. Yeah, and I've got a uh, large collection of MP3s on the hard drive. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if iTunes would affect the uh, tags on it to lock them into iTunes. Could I still burn them through Nero or whatnot? Well, just because you bring them into iTunes doesn't right. necessarily mean that it touches the file in any way. What it's going to do is it's going to ca put it in a, the catalog for you so that it shows up in the list. It writes that information right. to a small little XML file, but it's not converting the MP3 to AAC in any way. There is a button, though, in the settings that you can click convert from MP3 to AAC, right. but I don't know why you'd ever want to do that because then you're just stepping down the right. quality one more level. You can play MP3 on your iPod. You can play AAC on your iPod. In the process of moving it from your hard drive onto the iPod, it does some really interesting things to scramble it, so basically you can't drag it off your iPod and put it on any random desktop or anybody else's system, right? The idea that you won't use your iPod as a tool for piracy because, you know, that's a really efficient way to distribute songs. But with the service of the rest of the MP3s in your system, no, it, it shouldn't affect them. Don't delete them once you put them on your iPod. And once you do that, you can still use Nero, like you said, or any other application. But iTunes does have the built-in CD burning capability, so you can burn it right back to right. a CD, just the same way that Nero would handle that as well. Does that make sense, TJ? Yeah, I just had some club mixes and stuff that aren't available, so I was hoping not to corrupt them when I unloaded them. Yeah. That's fine. It's not going to touch them. It's just going to, if anything, when you ch uh, check, uh, check the box that says Consolidate Library, mm -hmm. all it does is copy that file over into the iTunes right. folder and save it there, but it it's not going to... It doesn't erase the copy no, it left. It doesn't behind. erase it or do anything to it otherwise, unless you choose Convert to AAC. So. Yeah. Don't oh. convert to AAC. Thanks for the call. Oh, thanks. You're welcome, TJ. Have a good one, man. Good question. You don't go anywhere, folks. We have a whole show ahead for you, including day four of Ugam 8.0. We got the ultimate monitor for our big system. And up next, are you ready to take your games for a ride? Our first guest shows you how to make your Atari 2600 portable. We're talking Game Boy size. Well, a little bigger when the screen savers continue. The greatest games in the world are the ones where you are the champion. Ooh, I don't know what happened there. Robinson throws it down with authority. Davis sets the solid pick. Williams nails it. Madden, NHL 2004, Tiger Woods PGA Tour. And the world's greatest games are all on X-Play. We're going to tell you which one is worth your money and which one you should skip at all costs. Adam Sessler, Morgan Webb, X-Play, weeknights 11, 10 Central, only on Tech TV. You love the Atari 2600, it's got your favorite games, but it's kind of hard to sit in the back seat on the road, right? Portable Crusader Ben Heckendorn has been busy turning his 2600 into a mobile gaming device. Welcome to the screensavers, Ben. Thank you. This is awesome. We're going to talk a little bit about more of this in a second, but you've essentially turned an Atari 2600 into a portable. That's right. What, mm -hmm. was, the, what was the inspiration? I mean, did you want to bring it on the plane or... Well, you can get them on planes. Uh, I just, uh, it was about four years ago, I kind of was looking on the internet. I realized people were still interested in Ataris. I didn't think they were. And I'm like, hey, I'll uh, build something to kind of honor the memory. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, so 
I just designed it up and at work we have the machinery that allows me to build it, make mm -hmm. the cases, and so basically I could do it, so I did. So you basically have like, like what, plastic milling, CNC plastic milling machine? Yeah, it can mill plastic or aluminum or pizzas, whatever you want to put in it. Yeah. Very cool. So basically you worked with what, you, you like the 2600 hardware? Because a lot of people like they, they crack a Game Boy or a pocket PC to run an emulator. This is slick though. It's like, well this is the real thing. It's not an emulator. It's uh, the real thing. The actual board. Mm -hmm. You've also done a, a PlayStation. Right. Actually, I guess we have a picture of that, right? And then a uh, Nintendo. Did you, is it uh, basically Super the, Nintendo. Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Is it basically the, the same process of converting? For yeah, all it is. The uh, PlayStation is, you know, it's got more guts in it. The controller uh -huh. has more things in it. And the PlayStation was rather difficult to cram everything in. But, you know, it's the same principle. Well, yeah. Speaking of the principle, we should show, we actually, you've got a really cool video mm -hmm. that actually yep. shows the whole process yep. from sketches to actual construction. Mm -hmm. Can we roll that? Okay, first I start by sketching the unit and figuring out how I want it to look, the basic shape and whatnot. Then, more importantly, I draw it from the side, figuring out where all the parts go and how to fit everything into the depth that I have, in this case, 1.5 inches. I then measure all the components I'm going to use, such as batteries, screens, and boards, and draw them into the computer. I then draw the cases around those things so I know it's all going to fit. I also add screw holes and other features. When everything lines up, I'm ready to make the parts. A Gerber Sabre 408 CNC router uses the computer drawings to cut the parts out of a variety of materials. Here you can see the V-bit cutting a groove in what will become the front and back plates. After they are finished, the parts can then be removed from the stock. The three-quarter inch sidewalls for the unit are cut the same way. The control board, front plate, control risers, controls, control discs, screen riser, and screen plate are all routed and connected to look like this. The sides will be added later. Here's an Atari 4-Switch motherboard. As you can see, it's too big for a portable, so we're going to have to modify it a little using a bandsaw. A lot of the stuff that's on the board I just don't need, and the things that I do need, such as the power regulator and extra joystick ports, I'll just wire back on later. Uh, so that must have been... How did you did you did you ruin a couple of Atari 2600 figuring this out? The first one I built, I did it on the first try. Wow. Yeah, but... In the, the coming months after that, I did ruin quite a few while trying to improve it and learn the secrets, you know. It's pretty amazing. This is the actual Hack 2600 mm -hmm, board. Mm -hmm. And you basically, you reduce all that. You put about, what, two-thirds of the board off of here for the, from the switches uh, and stuff. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's about right. So mm -hmm. how do you actually make this fit into the case? Okay, well, if you go to the case here. Go ahead. It uh, goes in right like this. Mm -hmm. The 4x4. Four four, right like that down into the uh, spacing. And then... What we do is, you know, we have the uh, second player joystick port. That goes down here so you can plug in a second joystick and, you know, fight your friends in combat. There it goes. There's an aux power input, you know, running mm -hmm. off the wall. That's what a lot of, pe a lot of people do that. I was going to say the, the battery life. Well, and the batteries are, they're expensive. I mean, they're it. not like AAs. And there's an AV output jack. Mm -hmm. Plug it into your television, you know. You'll never see that in a portable. <laughs> and then, yeah. We actually, the, now this is the screen. Did it come out? Of, we have a Casio over there. Did this, this actually come out of a Casio? No, portable? I just brought this as an example because okay. uh, this is the, the casing that would be, this is in, in the actual unit, okay. but uh, it's pretty much the same thing, basically. Do you run it off the same AA batteries, or how does uh, that the work? The same uh, rechargeable? Uh -huh. Yeah, it runs off the same, yeah. It's 5 volts, just like the Atari. And we should actually point out, you use camcorder batteries. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. Because I, I had a camcorder that used those, and I was like, well, there's a battery, and uh, they were kind of small, so I'm, I gave it a try, and it worked. How'd you figure out how to make the adapter for the camcorder battery? Well, I just uh, I went to Radio Shack and like browsed through everything, and I saw the little Molex connectors that uh -huh. used to plug wires together. I'm like, oh, those look about right. So I got those and hacked them up and then kind of bent it, blobbed a lot of solder in, and then bent it and pushed it in, and I'm like, it, 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 it held it pretty good, so that's... That's how I hack that. That's you know. awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, you work with what you got. It's the least expensive way oh, to right, do it. Right, right. What was the hardest part? The hardest part of designing it or building to, one? To get it to work. Was it like getting the video Oh, out yeah, it was, it was the video. Um, on, the, they were, on the internet, you, they would say things like, you know, here's how to get composite video, you know, like your AV inputs on your mm -hmm. VCR, out of an old Atari, because they used to have those RF switches. Right. But none of the things on the internet that I could find, they were all kind of inaccurate, so I kind of had to modify what was available. The final solution was to... Uh, I don't know if we can get this. Oh, Use okay. two potentiometers and a resistor for the video. You get the Luma and the Chroma, and then you can adjust it till it looks right. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. That's a nice little hack. And, uh, and now people actually know how to do it properly. Right, it's on my site, yeah. And how long, from coming up with the idea that you wanted to do this, how long did it take to build the first one? The first one, it was about two months. Very cool. Mm -hmm. I'd say, you know, probably bits, you know, 
bits here, bits there to put it together? Or? Uh, well, again, the video was a, probably about a month of stumping on my part. That was that really held me up. Can we? Hey, we got a. You know, you've actually. I guess you have your website. Is it ClassicGaming.com forward slash VCSP. It's a subsite under the. Classic I'm going to put this down. Otherwise, I'll start playing it. Maybe yeah, it, it is pretty it. tempting. I know. <laughs> you've got Frogger. Uh, you know what? And we should also point out for folks that are ready to build your own. One of our producers actually. Have you met Scott? He actually built one based. Yes, on I saw that. It was, it was. It was. He had the retro colors. I mean, it was great. Like yellow and orange was. Scott, it? aren't you supposed to be assistant directing? <laughs> He's gone. So you have a, a pretty much a step-by-step -step article up at the screensavers? Mm-hmm, yep. Can we fire this out as we go to commercial? Yeah, we can do that. Very cool. Ben's put together an awesome step-by-step -step article at the screensavers. He's going to put the battery in because I don't want to hurt it. You'd be crazy not to check it out up at the screensavers.com. Stay put. Stay put. Our ultimate gaming machine is getting an ultimate monitor, and after the break, can Ali do wireless gaming with a kick? We'll see if the mobile 64-bit processors are anywhere near shipping when the screensavers continues. It's on the phone from Binghamton. Uh, I, Binghamton. I just hiccuped. I'm very sorry, folks. Binghamton, New York. My head almost exploded. How are hey, you, Allie? Hey, what's up? Not much, what's man. What's up? Uh, nothing much. What can we help you out with? Um, I've been setting money aside for getting a, a new laptop for a while now. Cool. And I'm I'm reaching my point, but I've I've uh, with the advent of 64-bit computing, and I've. I was wondering if I should wait for the 64-bit mobile processors to ship or if I should just get a desktop uh, processor in, in a laptop because I'm going to be getting my computer from a, uh, from a local maker. What, so, what do you plan on doing with the, the notebook mostly? Uh, everything. Right. I mean, like homework, using it in the library. It sounds like you want to play video games, though. Yeah, see, I, I want something that will that'll, uh, have... I wanted to be able to play like a like a say Unreal Tournament 2004 yeah. or Doom 3 when it ships. Mm -hmm. Doom 3 be yeah. nice. Um, but I want I want like a respectable battery life when I'm doing typing. Yeah. Well, okay. here, here's the problem, right? When you go for a gaming notebook, right? You spend a lot of money on a really high-end graphics card, which you can upgrade, and you spend a lot of money on a big heavy-duty processor, right? Because you generally want to get one of the desktop processors for gaming performance. When you do that, you get a nine-pound notebook with a two-pound power supply. Yeah. Um, I don't like carrying a notebook that weighs more than six pounds, and I weigh like 250, and I can carry feed bags all day. You notice it. It's really heavy. You're not going to carry it around. The other thing that happens when you go to a desktop processor is your battery life goes through the floor. Instead of getting Nothing. four hours to six hours or nine hours with an extra battery pack, you start getting into like the two hour to one hour range. Now, Ali, you said you were interested in a 64-bit laptop? Yeah, because um, this uh, person that's in town, they, they locally make computers and you can, they'll do anything you want. But I was wondering if I should just wait for them to ship the 64-bit mobiles before I get uh, home, or if I should just get the desktop. Well, we're lucky enough to have a lab that gets in all these great products and they, they test them out, they demo them. We actually have Robert Heron here. Mm -hmm. He's here today and he <laughs> is his hands on the latest 64-bit laptop. Definitely. Which one were you testing out? Actually, Voodoo has a brand new notebook out right now that we're looking at that we'll be showing off here in about, I think, about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And it is using the 64-bit part, the Athlon 64. So if you want a notebook right now with a 64-bit part, there is one. Biggest concern I have really is the graphics subsystem. Despite how powerful these CPUs are, and they do match the desktop components, mm -hmm. there isn't yet a mobile graphics solution that matches anything you can see find on the desktop right now. Do you so. see anything on the horizon coming out as far as like a, a high-end mobile graphics chip? ATI just announced M11, and that's what you can get in the new Dell notebook. Mm -hmm. And despite its advantages, it is right now the best thing you can buy. It's the Mobility Radeon 9700, technically. It still doesn't match the best of the high-end notebook or the high-end desktop parts. So right. if you're looking for pure performance, you are still limited by the graphics that you'll find in today's notebooks. Now, would that would that be equivalent to something like a GeForce 4, like high-end GeForce 4, or what do we? No, what, actually, uh, the 9700 mobile, the mobile 9700 part right. is just about identical to what you would find in the 9600 XT desktop part. So okay. it's a, a four pipeline graphics chip, not eight pipelines like you'd find in like the 9800 XT. And for gaming, those extra pipelines really kick in when you want to crank up the resolution to match the notebook resolution or, you know. 
you just want to play it with the best quality possible. What does that run, by the way, that laptop? Oh, you can spend all you want, but you can <laughs> configure it down to, honestly, they start about $2,000 on up. Okay. So it really depends on how big the hard drive. Do you want a 7200 RPM hard drive? Do you want a HD monitor? Do you want you know, a DVD burner in it? Right. Do you want a gig of RAM? Those things add up. Cool. Yeah, I gotta be honest with you, man. I'd, I'd get a smaller notebook, forget about gaming on the notebook, and like spend a thousand less on the notebook, spend a thousand on a gaming system for home. I agree. Put it in the portable box. I don't know, Robert, you, you in with that? <laughs> for long stretches, too, I also find that most notebook keyboards, if you are a serious gamer, you're going to find that your one hand that sits on the keyboard warms up from all that electronics just right under there. You don't have that with a regular keyboard. And granted, you can always plug another one in. But right. It's really the video card power. And until they can really match what's on the desktop side and all that has to do with heat and electrical usage, and there's a lot of issues there. But until they really get that down, I'd say in another year, they'll be really close. But. All right. So if you're looking for high-end gaming, we're still talking about the desktop, yeah. but it uh, looks like they're coming along. Coming Thank along. you, Robert. Good stuff, man. Holly, I'd wait on that one, bud. Yeah. Thanks for the call, though. Coming up after the break, our ultimate gaming machine is coming along nicely. We'll show you which monitor we chose and why. I'll give you a little hint, though. It's between 19 and 40 inches. That's all when the screensaver continues. When the military's called into action, the fighter jets roar, the tanks roll in, and the soldiers march on. And Tech TV suited up for the battle with a brand new season of Future Fighting Machines. Don't miss Future Fighting Machines. Tonight at 9, 8 central, only on Tech TV. Screensavers, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Kevin Rose. Coming up in this half hour, Uggum is going to get a little tweaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're going to tell you about password protecting special files from being deleted. So we'll tell you all you need to know. Our next caller wants to know, you know, how can they delete those files or can we keep them so nobody can get to them? We'll, we'll as, show them how to. As you point out, it's day four of our ultimate gaming machine. We just pulled the plug actually on the four monitors back here. That's why I like just started there. Basically, this week we're building our ultimate gaming machine. We're up to version 8.0. We're looking at monitors. Mm -hmm. Later on today, we're going to look at system tweaking. Tuesday, when we come back, so we got Monday off, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're going to be benchmarking them, talking about how fast we got it to run. Today, monitors. Monitors, we're talking about LCD versus CRT. We love LCD flat panels. Plasma, too big, too much money. But, you know, LCD versus CRT, we started using those 18-inch NEC Mitsubishi mm -hmm. monitors, the, the multi-sinks. We're like, wow, you know what? These are really up to gaming. But we started out with some basic gaming monitors. We started out with a 19-inch CRT, mm -hmm. right? Because you know what? In terms of value, glass is still the way to go, the big glass monitors. They're inexpensive. They run the high resolutions and great refresh rates. $300 gets you a great 19-inch gaming monitor, monitor like this one from NEC. And they've gotten a lot also, smaller too. Yeah, actually. The CRTs, we turn the side there, I mean, compared to how the way they used to be. Yeah, it's, it's a little shorter. They still have like a short throw, but you know, they're still a lot bigger than an LCD. We right. turn that one over there around. We also, if you're going for a high end, you're talking about not much money, 22 inch CRT, basically looking at one from View Sonic, it's like the P225F, which is a catchy set of letters and numbers. $440 for a beautiful screen that'll do resolutions I've never even heard of in like the 2035 by 1800 range. Right. But if you want to basically take advantage of a 16 by 12 resolution on a monitor, you know what? You don't have a big enough monitor, you're not going to be able to see it on the system. You're not going to be able to take advantage of a high-end graphics And the call. other problem with this thing is it weighs about 75, 80 pounds. Exactly. It's about 68 pounds. 68 pounds, that's what it is? 68 pounds oh. after you take it out of the packaging versus something like this, which is NEC's multi-sync LCD, the 1980SX. That's nice. it's the slightly bigger brother of the that. one we use on the set. That's weighing about 22 pounds. If you pull that all the way up, you can spin it. You can also see how you can do it in you know, like a portrait mode that's if you're cool. working with large documents. Yeah, there's, there's special software that'll flip that, actually. So so it looks, oh, it's awesome. The whole portrait mode thing. Now, 22 pounds, $850, 19-inch monitor, 21-inch monitor, $440. So basically, we're talking about a major price difference. Everybody was excited, though, when we got that one in. It's a huge LCD. It's a 40-inch LCD. It's running like a 12... 80 by 768 resolution to LCD 4000 from NEC. We're like, this is it. This is amazing. It's only $5,700. No problem. But the truth is, if you don't have like half of a you know dining room table between you and this monitor, you can't use it for very often because if you're up really close to it, you spend a lot of time going like this. We, trying we to tried. We put our keyboard right there. And you can do it for about five minutes until you get sick. Yeah, but yeah. or the, you know, your neck gets sore. But it's but a look great at this idea. Thing. Look at this. We're talking like, how much is this one way? 
I think it's about uh, 80 pounds. That's awesome. It's and it's about four or five inches thick. You know, but again, great for DVDs. Mm -hmm. Great if you want to have like an entire magazine open in front of you. It's great. Resolution's a little lower, 1280 by 768. It's running like a 16 by 9 portrait. Right. So here's what we decided on. We went with an LCD. 21 inch, it's the LCD 2180UX, also an NEC monitor. Again, we, we kicked the power on, so we're waiting for them to restart the generator in the back. This is the one though, $1,600, 22 inches, if you can see that, it's 21 inches, if you can see the gaming on it, it's beautiful, it's running at 1600 by 1280. Unbelievable when it's hooked up to that 9800 XT from ATI. The gaming is incredible. You can again, also ro rotate it again. That's you're great. You're never going to do that when you're gaming, but it's exciting to be able to read an entire 14 inch legal document in one throw. Because legal documents are fun when you have a nice monitor that turns to the side. Oh, yeah. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> now, one, one question though for you. Now, this, how much did this one run? That's $1,600. $1,600. Now, that's great for an ultimate gaming right. machine, but what is the monitor for the average home consumer that wants to spend for normal four or five hundred bucks? It was funny. It's been a a while since, if you take a look at these two, it's been a while since I've actually had a chance to look at a couple of CRTs and I realized something is one, $300 for a high end 19 inch monitor, you get a right. gorgeous piece of glass, it's a virtual scrap, a flat screen, so it looks very similar to the LCDs and you're going to have great resolution, probably be able to 1280 by 1024, 1600 by 1200 mm -hmm. is pushing it, but this is be an awesome, awesome gaming system for like mid range and I'll be honest with you, you stare at monitors constantly, every right. second you're using your computer, you're, you know, unless you're like, your eyes are closed and you're listening to your MP3 collection, you're staring at a monitor. Spend the money on the glass, spend the money to get the highest refresh rates at the at the screen resolutions you use. Because mm -hmm. if you do that, your eyes aren't going to want to fall out of your face after 40 minutes. And look, $400 for a 22-inch screen, you're going to need a deep desk. I don't think I could fit this on my right. lab bench in my Neither garage. Could I. But you know what? I'd figure out a way to do it. Because it's a nice to be able to use a big screen and to take advantage of the money you put into your graphics. Mm -hmm. And again, Big screen, nice picture. Trust us on that one. Nice. We like it. Now, you got a list of all these products on the website, I take it? All up to screensavers.com. Basically, everything we put into it, everything that's going into it, and we're going we're gonna to talk to Robert Heron in a few minutes. He's going to tell us how to tweak it to get the best performance. we got information on that up on the website, too. Good deal. Jessica? Jessica's yes, last one, Okay, so not sure where to buy that new component for your PC or where... Uh, can you find the best price? Well, there's one site that we always suggest you go to, and that's PriceWatch.com. It links you to tons of online sites to get the best price out of any PC component. Now, stay where you are. We're going to tell Nathan if he can password protect those extra special files of his from the Delete Goblins. And after the break, we'll show you some extreme tweaking for our Ultimate Gaming Machine when the screensavers continues. Tech TV Saturday nights. Find out how misfits became mainstream on Nerd Nation at 7. I think I'm having heat poisoning. I'm losing a lot of salt. At 8, it's the military's latest advances on future fighting machines. We're just an unstoppable force. Then find out the truth about excessive behavior on body hits. Followed by a real eye opener wired for sex. A lot of sex workers migrated to the internet because it's easier. You'll see it all Saturday starting at 7 Eastern on Tech TV. Let's check in with the fine folks over at Tech Live to see what's coming up tonight. News anchor Chris Leary. What's yes, up, Chris? I'm doing good there, Kev. How you doing, man? I'm pretty. I'm pretty <laughs> mad. You're stealing Jessica from us. I, what? I, I, I didn't hear. What happened? Oh, what, nice you try. About? You're just I'll trying. Show up next to you, Chris. Why? Why am I the last to know all these things? <laughs> Not... I don't understand. Like, what, like, what color are you wearing? This is almost matching your hair, isn't it? This, yes, it is. We're, start, we're almost starting to think. It is. Think Look at you guys that. flirting. I can't what wait. is I going cannot on wait here? She gets over here. She's doing a great job. And if you know, we, we, we like to steal all of you because we. Nobody do. steals our chicks. <laughs> Nobody yes, steals your chicks. I hope you liked your credit rating while you had them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I got to keep on your good side. Hey, listen to this. We got some cool stuff coming up after the screensavers on Jessica's new show starting Monday. All right, all right. And, what is it? Uh, actually, it's the latest technology that lets doctors get into uh, like kids' hearts. It's really? really, it's amazing. Yeah. Actually, tonight on Tech Live, we're going to show you how the surgical robots, look at that, are being oh, used to operate on toddlers and infants. These oh, are wow. really tiny little surgical oh, things. Look at that little kid. That's adorable. Oh, he does not look happy. Or she. I don't know much about babies. <laughs> One has a, an extra thingy. An extra what? A thingy. 
Oh, great. Now Just I guess to let we'll, you know, heads up. Yeah, Jessica's going to be doing some health reports, I guess, for us as well. I'm very articulate. So technical, an extra thingy. Uh, or whatever, I don't know. I guess she'll have to give me some, some lessons. I don't know. But that's what's coming up after the screensavers on our charming little show here. And uh, again, I'm so happy to get uh, Jessica over here, and I apologize. Me for too, Mr. You Larry Pants. All right, girl. Let's tear it up on Monday. I'm in. I'm with you. All right, thanks, Chris. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> That's what's coming up on Tech Live right after this show. Now, speaking of a little tweaking, Pat, you've been doing some ugging tweaking over there with Robert. Yes, but there's no birds or thingies in this no. one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still wrapping my head around that. Earlier in the show, we looked at the range of monitors we wanted to use with Uggen. We set on the, this right over here, this NEC, this multi sig LCD, 21-inch gorgeous LCD screen. Next week, we're going to talk about the benchmarks. But you know what? You want good benchmarks, you're going to have to fine-tune and tweak your system. you got to squeeze every last bit of power out of it. Robert Heron here knows everything about tweaking okay. systems. You're in from the Tech TV Labs. <laughs> Welcome back, dude. Thank you. So this is like, you know, we should tell folks, you, you should be getting some props because Intel Developers Forum this week, you sat in in one of the seminars. Yeah. It was you and like 19 people who do nothing but engineer systems for a living. The challenge was to tweak the BIOS settings right. on a system to see who could get the highest frame rate on a benchmark. Yeah, we had a quick three and about, yeah, probably about 40 people in the room on mm -hmm. about 20 different computers. And uh, the final project was, you started off with an initial benchmark request. 3, and then we just kept doing tweaks, seeing what the result was, do some more tweaks, try the result, and my group won. See, that, very nice. That's, Six, a, that's a pretty good accomplishment. Almost 630 frames per second. Which is probably <laughs> For whatever more that's worth than anybody. Yeah, they're yeah. probably like running Quake Call 3, 640 by 480. Yeah, exactly. So they're basically, they were throttling it on the It was uh, mainly a CPU processor we were looking at. So. It's a good thing, but you know what? What happens if you don't, if you basically don't configure your BIOS co correctly? You're probably losing anywhere from 5 to up to about 20% of the ultimate power that any particular configuration is capable of. What's the, I mean, what's the number one mistake people make by not going into their BIOS? What should they adjust first? For, especially for people who build their own machines, odds are if you buy one from a major manufacturer, mm -hmm. they've gone through the BIOS and done most of it, hopefully. Right. If not, the things that you can really tweak improve everything from speeding up the process of when you first hit the power button mm -hmm. to the moment you get the window screen. Other things include memory timings and CPU timings, as well as disabling things you don't use. So if we like tweaking here in the first boot device, second boot device, this is the classic stuff for startup. Right. If you don't ever want to boot from anything other than your hard drive, you know what, you can take those out of the process. What about some of the stuff that's going into, oh, I don't know. Before you do anything, uh -huh. kick back to the first menu here. The very first thing you want to do whenever you, A, download the latest BIOS, flash the computer with that. Okay. And if you're not comfortable with that, be very careful about doing it. Otherwise, you load the optimized defaults. There's usually a fail-safe default, which is the ultimate safe setting. Then you have the optimized default, or the uh, turbo default, or whatever you want okay. to call it. Start with that first, because that'll go through every one of the settings, and the guys who built the motherboard, mm -hmm. basically, they put their things, you know what, if you want the best performance, here are the settings we went with. That's essentially what you're loading up. And then you go back and through each one, and tweak from there. What do you recommend for learning? Because I know, okay, it's like, okay, ID primary master, it's my hard drive, it's my second hard Believe drive. Believe it or not, most of the stuff drives. on here you don't have to touch. It's really a few things, like if you didn't have a floppy drive, right. disable it. If you're not going to use the parallel ports, serial ports, turn those off as well. And basically it's, it's and a then, long process of sliding through there. Yes, and for the most part you'll see a page like this where you have integrated devices and things like that. Essentially if you need it, leave it on. If mm -hmm. not, you know, don't worry about it. The other good thing, too, if you're not sure about something, just leave it at the default value. Okay. And it's really hard to remember everything you've done when you change stuff, so you really want to make sure you write down specific changes that you do make. So when you go back, try a couple things, you've got it written down, you know what you did before, you go back and do it again, especially when you get into memory timings and right. CPU settings, because... <laughs> It can get pretty confusing when you've tried 10 different settings trying to find the best one. No, we talk about this a lot in overclocking, something to do, especially yeah. if you're treating with memory settings. If you do something, sometimes your system will not restart. This True. is a bad and unfortunate feeling. If you have the manual, don't throw away the manual to your motherboard. There's going to be a jumper on the motherboard. You plug the pin, you basically move it from two pins over here to two pins over here. It'll reset everything on the motherboard. This is a good thing. Now, it's going to undo all of your settings, but it will also allow True. your system to boot again. We like being able to boot our system. If we can boot our system, then we can go back in and configure everything. Some of the new motherboards also include large amounts of memory for the BIOS as well, where mm -hmm. it'll store additional settings that you've made before. So you can pick, like you've done one that you want to try out, like mm -hmm. a, I don't know what we call it, like a default BIOS setting, and then you've got the one you just saved from the last configuration. If it didn't work, it would go back to the previous setting. Got it. So it, they've done a lot in terms of making it easier for the end user to go ahead and tweak the settings they want in there.
Very cool. We should probably talk about driver updates, yeah. getting the latest drivers. Honestly, the most performance you're going to get out of anything in terms of systems. It's mm -hmm. good to go through the BIOS, good to optimize there, but your software, your mm -hmm. OS, there's a lot to be done in there in terms of just... The updates from the operating system. Yeah. Graphics drivers, whether you download you know, ATI from ATITech.com or your latest NVIDIA drivers. Definitely. Do you use the beta or do you wait for, or do you, you hold back on the more solid drivers? Uh, we do lots of system testing and we only use what they call wickled drivers, uh, WHQL. In your house, yeah. no, I, your I, never touch, I don't touch beta drivers anymore. Okay. It's like uh, too much of a crapshoot. If you have a good enough graphics card, you're really not going to get a whole lot more out of but it. But I can so, get three yeah. more frames per second. <laughs> I'd rather have stability day in and day out. Right. I just want to, you know, after a month of messing with it, I, I don't want to mess with it anymore. Right. It's like, I want to hit the power button, it comes on. Now, what about tweaking services? Now, this is where the, the, the road diverges. Yeah. Turning off excess services in, micro, you know, in Microsoft's uh, Windows XP. Or... I say don't touch any of those services. I personally, I, right. I mean, there are both sides of the fence. I'm sure somebody can provide, if somebody can provide me with one example where doing all the service tweaks, eliminating 30% of them that are right. running actually helps performance on a high-end system. It'll help speed your startup. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe that. But. <laughs> the road diverges, yeah. but you know what, we got the messenger, The messenger service. Let's definitely turn one. that one off. You don't enjoy getting the little gray screen that tells you you can buy stuff for less money? Hey, at least the XP64 uh, turns that off by default. It's so. a good thing. Robert? Good stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a ton of links, a ton of articles up on the website about tweaking Uggum or your ultimate gaming system. We're going to show you Tuesday the benchmarks for them. Trust me. Go to screensavers.com. Check out the article. It's good, good stuff. Coming up after the break, save your files from accidental deletion. We're going to be talking all about it with Nathan when he gets on the line right after these messages. <laughs> Coming up next, Tech Live, only on Tech TV. Be sure to catch Monday's show. It's an encore presentation. Find out what famous hacker Kevin Mitnick has been up to now that he's allowed to get on the web again <laughs> and see what we think about the RCA Lyra Video Jukebox plus a nifty free download that associates mouse strokes with your programs. That's all on Monday's show. It's going to be a fine, fine edition. For sure. Nathan joins us. Where are you from, Nathan? From Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Very all cool, right. Yeah. How are you doing tonight? Doing all right. How can we help you today? Well, I'm a Macromedia Flasher from Mount Pleasant. Uh, I got two machines. I'm running Windows 98 SE on both of them. I just wondered how you can, there's a way to password protect the deletion of a file so you can't delete it. No one can delete it. I, I got to ask, is there a precipitate, did somebody waste a project you were working on? No, just, not necessarily. I just, I just want to be safe for the future. Okay. Preemptive. What do you think, man? Well, you can in Windows. You said 98 second edition. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can always select just the choose properties on it and then choose read only, mm -hmm. and that way someone isn't. They're going to be prompted to delete it, but they can still get around that. You can still just you know choose write again and delete the file. But we, we don't have a 98 second edition box here, so we can't demo that. But uh, have you ever considered upgrading to like Windows XP? Oh uh, yeah. It's Something I'm probably going to do in the future. Yeah, that one main benefit of Windows XP is it uses the NTFS file system, which makes things a whole lot more secure. You can actually go in there and you can encrypt your files. You can also put documents in the My Documents bin that only you will have access to. Other users on the machine or other accounts that you create won't be able to get in there. So there's no way they can possibly delete them. But the only problem with 98 is that it was using FAT. That means anybody can get in the right. machine. They easy can, to access, easy to run from different operating systems, terrible for security. There's third party applications you can run that can basically lock down a file, either encrypted or unencrypted. Right. It'll basically force someone to enter a password before they can make it disappear from your desktop. I'm thinking, you know, go to downloads.com and probably pick something up for thirty to fifty dollars. Should we should we show you Nathan what goes on when you when you actually right click and select properties on a on a document inside of XP? No, I'm from oh, on XP, yeah sure. Okay. So basically right click properties. Kevin, where do we want to go to next on that one? Well, from here, if you check the, the read-only box, I mean, first of all, you have to understand that anything that you create in XP under your account is locked down. There's no way that any other user on that machine, unless they're administrator. Right. But you pointed out to me earlier, you said, yeah. well, what if I'm admin? Well, admin can get into anything. And that's one of the problems, right? If you have three or four people, if you let them all install software in your system, that means they probably all have administrator privileges. They can browse everything on your particular section of the hard drive. So there's another option here that you can go then into the advanced options.
and then choose uh, the encrypt this file. It should be at the bottom there. There, encrypt this uh, data, and that'll say it's going to encrypt it using your password as part of the key. So that even if there's an administrator on the box, mm -hmm. there's a special registry that they could, but most likely they can't even get the encrypted contents. So that's also a nice feature as well. There's so many additional features that are built into Windows XP that is the reason why we run it on all our computers right. here and at home. Basically, it's more stable, it's more secure on the same hardware. It's going to give you a little bit better performance. I got to say, Nathan, it's probably not a bad idea if, if you're willing to, to move up to XP. Yeah, Nathan, if you're going to go on download.com and you find a file, it's probably going to cost you, you know, 40, 50 bucks to buy the file anyway. You're spin halfway to... halfway there, spend a little extra cash, and go ahead and uh, get the Windows XP. It's time, Nathan. All right, makes sense. Good luck, Thank man. You. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Now, here's Jesse with one final great tip for you. Great tip. Okay, so on the screen savers, I've been fortunate enough to interview the stars as they deal with technology. And if you missed any of these A-list celebrity interviews, go to the show notes at thescreensavers.com, and you'll find the bit chat depot that, that'll that link you to a bunch of my favorite interviews. Now, stay where you are. We've been getting a lot of emails, and we're going to give you the best answers ever when the screen savers continue. Oh, yeah! Be a guest. That's right. Come see the show in person. If you're going to be in the San Francisco Bay Area and you would like to join the Screen Savers live on the set, go to techtv.com slash ticket line for information and to request tickets. Go there so we can see you here. When the military is called into action, the fighter jets roar. The tanks roll in, and the soldiers march on. And Tech TV suited up for the battle with a brand new season of Future Fighting Machines. Don't miss Future Fighting Machines. Tonight at 9, 8 central, only on Tech TV. Charles joins us on the phone from Scottsdale, Arizona. How you doing, Charles? Hey, Charles. Good, how are you guys doing? Great, Excellent, man. How can we help you? Well, I have a question for you. I'm wondering about getting a RAID system, and I'd like to know all the benefits of that. Well, the, the benefits depend on really what kind of RAID you're setting up, right? A redundant array of inexpensive drives basically take two drives or four drives, or if you have big iron in a server, you might take five or six drives, right? Yeah, I was thinking about like a four drive system with like 300 gig drives. Wow, are you thinking nice. like setting up a RAID 5? Yeah. Okay, so basically, like, I'm not going to be able to, RAID 0 would be striping across multiple drives. It basically makes you really fast sequential writes. RAID 1 is going to give you the, basically, you'll have a mirrored situation, mm -hmm. right, where you're writing the same thing to two different drives. So if one of the drives dies, you've still got one good one. You can reactivate it. Right. We start getting up into like 3, 4, and 5. 5, you're basically striping across all the drives in a way that mirrors the information so that one of the drives dies. You can replace it with another drive, and it can reconstruct all those information. Right. You're really paranoid about losing data, aren't you? Well, yeah, because my computer crashed like mm -hmm. two months ago, and I lost a lot of information. So I'm really w worried about that happening again. So I want to set one up. Um, the, I got to be honest with you. It, you. I mean, you can just go with standard. Is there any reason that you need that much storage? Or I mean, you can just go with two drives and do a mirroring situation. No, I'm also considering other options too, like. Um, backing up some of my DVDs and stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the first thing I'd say is, is part of the problem is, is like if you've got like 100 gigabytes of data on there, about the only way you're going to be able to, to back it up is to have another giant hard drive. And right. if you're really paranoid, like there's different degrees of paranoia. There's hardware crashing, great. So you can, like Kevin was saying, do like a RAID 1, you mirror it across right. two drives, or on a weekly basis, you back it up to an external uh, 1394, a FireWire, USB 2.0, a network drive, or you set up a file server, you back all the stuff off to the file server. If you're running Linux, it's usually pretty bulletproof. I did an article about those a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago. Windows XP. Oh, that's fine, man. It's, it's, I'm saying if you set up a file server, you might want to do something like a Linux-based one because Linux is just so stable and, and bulletproof. The problem is when you configure something like this, right, you're spending hundreds of dollars you're spending a lot of money, especially you know if you don't have an enterprise quality case, right? You got you can you can mess up a lot with a RAID five, and if somebody steals the computer or your house burns down, you still lose all your data. Mm -hmm. I'm in the process right now. I'm going to do a RAID actually at my house. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set up a little free BSD box and throw a couple of big drives in there and just do the mirroring situation because mm -hmm. I don't want to lose any of my data. I have so many video files right. and things like that. So yeah. that's a good idea. I think RAID is really cool because they're building it on all the new modern motherboards. Mm -hmm. You practically can't find a motherboard without some right. type of RAID well, it became a really hyped up thing. Guys are like, yeah, I'm going to stripe across my drives. I'm going to get amazing performance. But usually when you're reading data off a drive, RAID slows it down. Makes it more complicated. you got to spend double the money because you got to have two drives. 
good way to do mirroring and back it up. You know, if you're worried about losing data, back up your data. Yes. Get an external hard drive. If you're really paranoid, have two hard drives, back it up to that. Take one to work, leave it there, bring the other one home, swap them back and forth. And That's you have it. a review of all those external hard drives that you just checked out here about a week and a half ago. Yeah, we got like links and all the information. We do. Information. We'll put that on the site for him. Good stuff. Jeff, Thanks for the call. Yes. Your I, final email? My final email. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I, I will still be on the show every day with the hits. Okay. Anyways, hello. <laughs> Is it safe to attach PDF files to emails? I send many attachment uh, files uh, uh, to save printing and postage. Also, last Friday, February 13th, 2004, a caller asked about digital body for his Pentax D. It will use all of the Pentax lens mounts. Well, Thank well, you, Chris. I realize there were two questions in there. But, <laughs> but the first one, right, the, the problem is, 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 you know what, if you're going to attach PDFs, you know what, attach them, warn people if they're coming. The problem is, is attachments can often contain viruses who, you're just going to have to live with it. It's, yeah. it's hard. It's, I've, I've talked to a bunch of different guys, and they always say that PDFs are cool to attach, so... No, no. Be careful. Yeah, we be want careful. to leave it enough time to leave you with a little something. We want to thank Jesse for all her hard work, her great energy. Oh, get You've out. added we got the screen oh, savers. We got some treats. Oh my we God! We want to wish you the best of luck. So much. And we got nice. you a little something too because uh, you know we want you to feel at home when you go to your new show, and so this oh, little shirt that you can wear. Yeah. I saw that, Pat wearing this the other yeah, day. Yeah, he likes that. That'll, that'll fit just great. <laughs> thank you guys so Not much. Oh, you guys want to see that? There you go. Oh, thank you guys so much. Thank you. We're gonna miss you, Jess. Thank you, King. Oh, oh, gosh. Gosh. Ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this edition of the Screen Savers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Kevin Rose. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'd like to thank our guest, Ben. Why did he say his last name? Heckendorn. Heckendorn. And Robert Heron once again. Jess, we're going to miss you, but we will see you right next door in Tech Absolutely. Live. Absolutely. Fire good up the audience, oh. folks. We'll see you next time. Have a great night. <laughs>